So this is lecture 22 of ECE 2305. And so, OK, in today's lecture, what we're going to be talking about is the continuation of routing protocols. So last class, which was how many moons ago? Many. Um, so that was actually, it was not, was it Monday? No, uh, well, no, no, Mon Monday was Patriot's Day. Tuesday. Oh, my dear. So I haven't, that's why I feel like I'm totally out of sync with life, OK? What happens is uh, in last lecture, in lecture 21, we looked at Dijkstra's and Bellman Ford algorithms for routing. And so what they did is they provided us with strategies for minimizing some sort of cost. So when I talk about cost, right, cost means many different things. You go to a store, how much does that cost, right? Like this weekend, you know, because my, my wife asked me to, you know, redo the garden fence and stuff because, you know, the deer are somehow coming in. Um, you know, I'm going to go to Home Depot. I'm going to check. Oh, so that's how much that 4x4 four four pressure treated lumber is going to cost. What do I do? I go to Lowe's. And Lowe's is a remarkably, you know, a few cents cheaper or something like that. So that's one cost. But cost also applies to processes. And so when we talk about routing and we talk about cost, what we're thinking about is, like, we want to go the path where there's a least amount of cost. There's a least amount of penalty. There's a least amount of resources and time and degradation in performance to get information from point A to point B. So let's recap from lecture 21. What do I mean? So let's look at Dijkstra. So Dijkstra and Bellman Ford, to, to, to an extent, they, what they both attempt to do is suppose you have a network, right? So here's a node. This is a router, or something that can do routing, right? Router, router, router. All these boxes are routers, OK? I should have a legend element. Okay. And suppose that these routers all have lines to them, right? And this is my sloppy way of drawing lines. Actually, I should do also bidirectional, just, just for fun. So suppose I have this mesh of routers, and information can go either way, right? So what happens? So what we want to do is, let's say this is point A, and we want to send information to point B. Last lecture, lecture 21, what we wanted to do is, what is the best possible path to get information from point A to point B, right? And so what we did is, and, and we didn't go into too much detail about it, I had these funny numbers. I had 1, and I had 2. I had 4, I had 3. I had 8, and I had 10. I had these pairs of numbers going one way and going the other way. What does this all mean? That is cost, folks. What happens is it is the cost of using that path. And cost can be many different things. Latency, do I get a hit for using this path over another path in terms of the amount of time it takes to send the information across, right? Is there, in case of, let's say, a wireless router, does this path have worse signal-to-noise ratio versus another path? which is also super bad, right? And there's a number of other metrics. Perhaps cost is reflected by congestion. Suppose, like, you know, just intuitively, which one of these routers you would expect to be more congested than other routers? Do, 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 Woo, this guy here, he has six incoming and outgoing paths. This one, by far, and it was totally unintentional. This was a fluke. But what happens is this router here, he's going to be a very busy bee. Actually, six? No, seven. So what happens is you can expect that the cost, he's centrally located. Let's say I take this path here, route, uh, you know, the one that has one as a cost, and I send information down that path. What would be the obvious to get to B from this guy here? Let's say we call him C. Oh, well, I'm going to route through D and then to B, right? That's the fewest number of hops. Would that be cost effective? Perhaps not. Because maybe part of the cost is, well, this guy's super duper congested. 
So I might want to, D could set a cost. D can say, intentionally or unintentionally, saying, I have way too much traffic, it's going to cost you, right? Just like, you know, let's say you have, um, like for instance, this past winter, um, you know, what happens when your pipes are frozen and they burst and you have to call the plumber at 3 o'clock in the morning? And that plumber receives your call as well as 50 other people because it went way below, let me think, 0 degrees Celsius is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and stuff. But let's, oh, uh, what? Minus 40 Celsius. Yeah, minus 40, minus 40 is when they both converge, right? We haven't reached that this winter yet. Or, well, sort of, with wind chill. As my dog and I found out, we're like out there, and it, when, he, when he feels cold, you know there's a problem, right? So, but what happens is, when we go below zero degrees Fahrenheit, that's when you, and the wind chill is about mix of minus 20, minus 30, that's when you're worried when the pipes in your walls get frozen, right? This, uh, depending on what, but what happens is, that plumber is probably getting phone calls off the hook. Hmm, three o'clock in the morning? It's going to cost you. But let's say any other time of the year, it's, and business is slow. Oh, OK, I'll, I'll give you a discount, right? That router there knows it's in a high traffic position. It's going to get a lot of demand, so it's going to up the cost. Why? Well, not necessarily because he wants to make money. The concept of making money not, does not necessarily apply here. But the cost would be to you. In the sense of, if you send information this way, what's going to happen? There's a risk that you might not be accommodated. Your bandwidth might not be accommodated. The cost is, you might experience a penalty in performance. Right? So cost is a metric that says, essentially, it's going to penalize you. Right? Latency is a penalty. Not being able to accommodate your bandwidth is a penalty. Many, many hops from trans uh, source to destination is a penalty, right? Just like if you get a speeding ticket, it's a penalty. Don't do that again, right? So what ends up happening? Oh, I so badly wanted to ask, how many people here have a speeding ticket? No, no, I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> so what ends up happening is this is great. We saw through Dijkstra, Dijkstra yesterday, he established, let's say from a specific router, across an entire network. What are the costs? Going down this path, this path, this path. Specifically, what Dijkstra did is he, the algorithm enables you to calculate what the end-to-end -end cost would be down every possible conceivable path from A to, to B in this case. And then Bellman Ford did it on a per hop, then two hop, then three hop, then four hop, all the way to n hop to get to the end uh, to the destination. But here's the question. And the question is, does the internet work like this? And the answer is no. What happens is, we would call this network, there's a specific name for a type of network like this. It's called flat. What does flat mean? Flat means all routers, all nodes, are kind of treated the same in the same plane of existence and all the paths kind of internetwork with each other with the same routing protocol. In real life, this would not work, right? Because we're, what do routers do? So again, we, we talked about this. So there is routing, and there is forwarding. Okay. So remember, what is the definition of routing? Finding the path from A to B that minimizes costs in particular. You can route, like, you know, you can develop anything that r route, right? But it's almost like, okay, um, go from here to Clark University and just go, figure it out, right? And like, let's say I don't put any cost. You might arrive at Clark five hours later. You might arrive at Clark, but you have a few bullet holes in your car. You <laughs> might, you know, like, you know, there might be, you, but what happens, let's say I constrain it to saying, Get the Clark in 20 minutes in the safest, most, most direct route. Now you have a cost, right? The cost being like, you know, penalty is, well, safety or lack thereof, and time, right? Like, oh, you have to get there, there's a class, right? And none of us want bullet holes in our car. Well, absolutely not. It will take forever to, to get those out. So routing is the path formation. Forwarding, 
which is closely coupled with routing. Forwarding is that each one of these routers, let's say we take router A, has a table. And what ends up happening is if we have an IP address and we have a destination, uh, end destination, we know where to forward the information to. So, oh, I got information here and I want to go to B. Oh, 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 you want to go to C. Doop, right? Then C says, oh, you want to go to B from A? Oh, okay. You want to go through, let's say, a router E, right? And then E got it. Oh, you want to go to router B from A and you went through C? Perhaps you want to go this way to uh, router F and so on. So forwarding is the action of passing information to an all, uh, you know, sort of end destination from a source. So we have these forwarding tables. You got this, I'm going to send you here. I got this, you're going to go here. So remember, switch means I got an IP address, I want to send this. No, I have information, or which, I, which computer do I send this to? Port 1, port 4, port 3, right? If you have a 16 port switch, you know wh whichever computer is connected to it, it just says, oh, you want this, you want this. It's really fast. A router, on the other hand, has to translate, w w like, first of all, uh, your header information of, the, of what it's receiving. Oh, that was the source of the information. It wants to ultimately go here. Where do I go? How do I route this? So what you guys are doing with traceroute, that's the beauty. Like earlier today, so we trace route to, um, let me pronounce this right, Macare University, right? Did I get that right? So, so if you want to find a server in Africa, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell everybody uh, this because th this is cool because you have to see the trace route for it. So www.mac. Oh, yeah, that's such a cool, like, imagine you go to university, Mac, right? And then I think it's AC. UG? Yeah, AC.UG. AC.UG, thank you. So what this means, the rest of the world, so what signifies a web address here in the United States that belongs to a university.edu? A lot of other places around the world, usually if it is an academic institution, it's .ac, then country code, like UK. In this case, Uganda is UG. Also, if it's a corporate website, sometimes it'll be CO, Dot UG. So let's say it's like some store, like let's say um, Jim's. Let's say there's a company called Jim's. Mm -hmm. And then dot c c -O dot UG means it's a corporate website. It's got a company's name is Jim or whatever you want to abbreviate to, and it's located in Uganda, right? So what happens is if you do trace route to this, you're going to see that <coughs> forwarding table in action. That's why I asked you guys to do trace route. Because you're going to see from your computer, it might go to several WCI computers, it, and then you're going to see it go onto some internet too at some point. Then it was kind of interesting with Macare Mac Mac University. It actually ends up in South Africa. South Africa has an extension .za, okay? And and so what <coughs> happens is in certain parts of the world, like for instance in Canada. Um, most internet traffic that comes across the Atlantic Ocean ends up at University of New Brunswick. So you're going to see like unb.ca because that's like the main, um, you know, one of the main points of contact with the internet with Canada, also part of the United States, and say Europe across the, the pond, if you want to call it that way. I'm suspecting based on how that traffic was flowing, that's going to South Africa. And then there was like a gajillion hops. Boop, 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 boop. And then it made it to Uganda. Okay. So the reason for this <coughs> exercise is to see how information routes from A all the way to B. Now, does this scale? And the answer is no. Imagine you've got millions of routers. Not going to scale well. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have a gajillion elements in your forwarding table. And what do we know about really large lookup tables? Scan, 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 scan. Oh, okay, I found it finally. So what you want to do instead is you want to have some sort of hierarchical, hierarchical, yeah. <laughs> something not flat, 
um, scheme for routing. Okay, and so that's where that's where the lecture ooh, the lecture slides come in. So, like just going back momentarily, I'm going to go back to doodling very soon. So what happens is this is all ideal, but the problem is doesn't scale, right? Imag because imagine the World Wide Web is just all routers and all flats, and you're forwarding this information. It's going to take you forever. Every router has to know everyone else's router and all the forwarding tables. It's going to be a disaster. It's like, you know, you think the internet is still slow now. Wait until you make everything flat. It's like, doop, 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 doop. So what happens is doesn't scale. Second thing, um, you do want some level of administrative autonomy. You want every sort of router or network of routers within a specific network to sort of take care of itself. You have an administrator, and, and it's actually kind of interesting. What happens is in specific networks, whenever you set up a network uh, and you have routers and stuff, you have to specify, and maybe my friends at the CCC can confirm, you have to specify um, who is the physical human point of contact in case bad things happen, right? So for ECE net, and I'm not sure if he's changed it yet. I hope he did. Bob Brown is the point of contact. So anything bad happens, like, oh, you got this, like, um, you know, um, you know, illegal video software server that got installed by a Trojan or something. So let's say one of the computers in the network got hijacked and it's secretly distributing movie files and such. What's going to happen? Um, Bob Brown at ece.wpi.edu will get, uh, you know, an email from either, uh, um, you know, either another network saying that you, you're attacking us, maybe distributed uh, denial of service attack, or if it's the owner of the material that is being distributed legally, is going to get potentially um, a letter from a lawyer saying, please cease and desist right now. I don't like those letters, right? It's like, you know, please cease and desist. Like, don't want to deal with lawyers, not a lot of fun. So what happens is Bob then has to work, make sure that the computer is removed from the network, and the thing is, also the CCC has a lot of um, sniffers. Like, like we're not allowed to be sniffers, but they they can just detect things like illegal distribution of movies and ICQ and all that bad stuff, right? And then what happens is when the issues resolve, show proof that yes, we've taken care of the issue. Don't worry about it. And it's like okay, check. We won't sue you. Okay. Ah, lawsuits are not fun. So, so hi, higher archial. Yeah, close enough. Routing, what it does is it breaks down your network into groupings of networks and then the groupings are internetworked with each other. So we call each grouping of routers which into a region, we call it autonomous system, so AS. And so what ends up happening is um, we have a bunch of routers, they're part of an AS. There's another bunch of routers, there's a, and they're part of an AS. And what ends up happening is the following. So we've got, let's say, let's say we redraw this, let's say we redraw the internet once again. Okay. So suppose these are all routers. Okay. So what we're going to do now instead is instead of it being a flat layout, okay, it's not. It's going to be Yeah, uh, art, art, you know what I mean. So, so what it ends up happening is we're going to break up this. We're going to classify them instead into, let's say, this is AS1. So this is autonomous system one. We have another autonomous system. Let's say this is AS2 and so on, AS3, and finally this guy, say AS4. So we have these different AS uh, formations, and what this does is instead of having a flat architecture, which means we're going to have huge lookup tables, right? Those forwarding tables. So again, remember, routing and forwarding tables, so forwarding. So what, now what we have is instead, each router has a forwarding table 
just for all the other routers within its AS. Much simpler. So what ends up happening is we keep the router number small, keep supporting tables manageable, and what ends up happening is we might have one guy, and we will refer to him as a BGP, like, or uh, he, ha he executes a BGP. So he's a border gateway protocol router. His responsibility is to connect this AS with, say, another AS over here. So they use BGP, and this is our gateway router, to connect with another gateway router at another AS. And they use this border gateway protocol in order to communicate with each other. So the responsibility now, so now we've made multiple tiers. Inside the AS, if we have data, so let's say I have information here, and I want to make reach this guy over here, well, what ends up happening is that's really simple. We have all these lookup tables, And what ends up happening is like, well, in that case, this will be your best path. Very simple. Small lookup table, right, the forwarding table. Um, we don't have to do anything too expensive. It get, information gets there quickly. On the other hand, so, well, okay, so this is called intra-AS routing. So intra usually implies that we're doing something within a structure, right? And then inter, this is the other type that we're going to be looking at now. Inter, AS routing, on the other hand. What it does is suppose I want to take that information and, and send it to AS2. So the structure here is a little bit different. So what we need to do is, first of all, route that information, if there's a direct path or not, send it to the gateway router, and through the BGP, the border a border gateway protocol, it needs to figure out of which other gateways and which ASs this information must be sent to, right? In this case, that gateway router will say, oh, I need to go to that other gateway router in AS2. So what ends up happening is send information to this gateway router. The gateway router knows where to send that information to this gateway router, so now he has it. And then that gateway router sends it to the target. So what I've just done is I've divided and conquered. What I've just done is I've decomposed this large network of routers into these smaller regions. And these smaller regions have single points of contact with each other. And then those single point of contacts with BGP, right? what they do is they swap information with each other. I'm going to explain in a few minutes what I mean. But what the BGP protocol, what it does, is it says, oh, so who do you have at your end? Who, who's in your region? So what happens is, it's this gateway router that's responsible just to get bump the information roughly to the right region, and then let that gateway router sort it out. It's really cool. So at the end of the day, because of this tier, we do not have a massively flat, inefficient network. Rather, we can break things up into these regions and then let the regions take care of it. All right? So, I'll keep that. Ha -ha. So now, so that's what hierarchical uh, routing is, okay? So, that's where that interconnected AS comes into, into play, right? So, we can either do routing within internal destinations and we have intra and inter AS routing when we deal with two, two, let's say, source and destination in totally different AS regions. And so that's where BGP, and BGP has several mechanisms. We have eBGP, e which means, so remember subnet, we can have of a network, we can break it down into these individual subnetworks. What ends up happening is the eBGP e part of the BGP protocol is that we can obtain a subnet for reachability of information from a neighboring AS. So this is really important because what we need to know is, hey, gateway, can I reach this guy in your region? 
uh, based on the uh, request that I have over here from this element here. So really what I need to know is, I need to understand, can I reach this guy on your subnet, on your region? And then the IBGP is the propagation of the reachability information to all the internal routers. Okay. So what ends up happening is when you have a BGP session, you have the two BGP routers, right? So going back to my original diagram, what ends up happening is this gateway router, this gateway router, and there are probably a few others. So that's part of AS2, AS3, that might be your gateway router, and AS4, that might be its gateway router. All these guys periodically exchange information because a network is very dynamic, right? So sometimes the computer might turn on, sometimes it might turn off. New IP address is allocated, maybe one is removed. It could be DHCP, so no one's guaranteed an IP address. So what ends up happening is there's constant communication between these, um, these, these um, um, ASs saying, okay, um, well, like, what do you have now? What's your topology? Who's, which routers are available? Can I reach within your, your region? And so what ends up happening is you advertise the paths to different destination network prefixes. So this prefix is what's really important. This prefix tells me, am I on the right path? Am I sending this to the right autonomous system? Okay. And so what happens is, when AS2, in this case, advertises a prefix to AS1, what this means is AS2 means that it will promise to deliver and forward that datagram sent by the node, by the router in AS1, to someone in AS2. Okay. Oh, and there's also this guy here too, the IGP, or Interior Gate <coughs> Gateway Protocols. And so there's actually three here, and one of which is OSPF, which I'm going to focus on a little bit more than the first and second. So, <coughs> so the first one, RIP, <coughs> it sounds really cool. It doesn't mean rest in peace, okay? Mm -hmm. So like, it, like when I saw it, I said, RIP, okay, cool. No, what RIP is, what RIP is, it, it's a type of uh, distance vector algorithm. What, what it does is, it, its metric is number of hops. More hops, further away. More hops means more latency, it's undesirable. So what ends up happening is the distance metric, right, in number of hops in, and subnets, right, what we want to do is we have a maximum of 15, and what we do is every 30 seconds, there's sort of an advertisement <coughs> stage as well. And why we have that is if, let's say, there's no advertisement heard in 180 seconds, we assume that guy's no longer active, he's dead, right? And so what ends up happening is we now have to send out new advertisements and sort of describe the networks that are out there. So it's very dynamic. So 30 seconds, like, you know, you're advertising yourself. In 180 seconds, if there's no advertisement, you're no longer in existence. Something happened. You're disconnected from the network. And then now everyone has to adapt to the new change in topology. OSPF is very commonly used in a lot of networking applications. So this, remember folks, is intra-networking, okay? In, uh, the, the intra-networking AS. So what, what this guy does, uses Dijkstra, uses Bellman 4, uses these algorithms in order to send information through several routers from point A to point B. So there is a term here that you guys might not be familiar with unless you live in like low-lying areas close to large bodies of water. So, mm -hmm. um, so the, the idea of flooding, I did not bring this up in the last couple of lectures, but let me, let me explain what flooding is. So in general, like, you know, folks know what flooding is, right? So basically uncontrollable amounts of water coming in, comes in through the windows, the door, and it just like, you know, you can't deal with it and you're just overwhelmed. In a network, what is flooding? Seems like some people are already starting the weekend. So what happens is, this is what flooding is all about. Suppose again, I have, let's say this is my set of routers. 
So when I say I'm flooding, so suppose I want to propagate information to the entire network, like multicast, right? So I'm going to send all this information to everyone within this network. I know, this is taking forever. So what ends up happening is the following. I'm going to, let's say this here, this guy, is my source. And I have some really important information I want to share with everyone, right? So flooding. So what I do is every guy that's linked to me, I'm going to send a message. So I'm going to send a message here, 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 and here. So now this guy has the message, 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 message. Now what they do in turn is they forward this information to all the folks who haven't heard them yet. So you see what I'm getting at, right? So now this guy, okay, who did, I, did not hear it? Oh, I'm going to send it to him. Oh, he didn't get it, so I'm going to send it to him. So what essentially happens is it's this ripple effect. The information comes from a single point and just goes to everyone, right? It just like, it essentially is, oh, I heard a message. I'm going to repeat to everyone. So imagine, yeah, I really don't know how to do flooding in this classroom because I think I'm loud enough that everyone can hear, right? <laughs> There's no need to repeat. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so what happens is the idea of flooding is if uh, in a wired scenario is you send this message and then everyone in turn is going to send it to all their links and then all their links and then all their links. So, like, you know, and this happens also in real life a lot of cases as well. Like, for instance, uh, chain emails, right? It's like, you got this message, send to 20 more people, and then those 20 people get it, send to 20 more people. And it's just like, that's, that's kind of a, like, you know, sort of a humanistic version of flooding. Now, ah, so what ends up happening? Okay, so what ends up happening is we send these advertisements of, you know, these availability of links and such to everyone within my AS. So every router, I just flood. I, I give them, hey, I'm available, I can accommodate links. And so now everyone knows that I'm out there, I can support links, and I have my forwarding tables ready, and I can take care of anything. So, and what, what happens is, in turn, within that network, we, have, we can use things like Dijkstra's, right? The shortest path approach, or low, lowest, least cost. The thing about OSPF over RIP is that it's secure, right? So it has authentication to prevent people from making some sort of malicious intrusion. Because imagine you're like in a flooding environment. How do you know that that guy is like the legit individual? How do you know that someone might maliciously try to go into your network and claim to be part of your network? So your TA, uh, Le, his master's thesis, which he did with me, what he did is he played a little trick on Wi-Fi. And what he did is he did something called man-in-the-middle attack. So what he did is, like, you have a Wi-Fi network, and so, you know, you have your laptops or your devices, Wi-Fi devices, you try and connect to that Wi-Fi access point, right? What he tries to do is, oh, I'm the Wi-Fi access point. I have this IP address. Oh, MAC address? Yeah, I have that IP uh, MAC address as well. He spoofed his MAC address. He assumed the same IP address. So he was receiving about almost the same amount of traffic as the uh, access point, the re legit one, and then that's bad because then, oh, I got a hold of your data. Now I can do bad stuff, right? So how do you defeat that? So you know that experiment, in part of experiment three, where you're taking, okay, you're one meter away from the Wi-Fi access point, five meters away, ten meters away. He used distance. He looked at the strength. If your malicious man-in-the-middle access point attack is about 10 meters away from the legit one, you, after a little bit of distance, you can start discriminating based on RSS strength. Oh, that guy, he's not supposed to be there. And this guy, you can basically tell, first of all, I get two, two strong signals. There should only be one. 
So that's the first hint saying, I think there are two Wi-Fi access points here, which is wrong. If you have two of anything with the same MAC and IP addresses, there's something very seriously bad, right? And then you have to, to figure out who's who. And so he, we actually published a paper on it. It was actually pretty neat. Just all on signal threat. Anyways, so what ends up happening is you have OSPF. It does this, this the, you know, has more security. Um, it also supports like the multiple same cost paths um, as opposed to RIP. Um, and there's multicast support. And, you can, and also hierarchical uh, OS, OSPF is possible in large domains. So, and then you can also do things called backbone OSPF and local area OSPF. So backbone, suppose, like what, what does it mean, backbone? So what happens when someone has a backbone? It means that it's supporting the rest of the structure. So you might have some sort of infrastructure behind your wireless network or your wired network. So you might have a bunch of routers that support the backbone network. And then you have a bunch of routers that are for a local area network. And you can use OSPF in those scenarios. Right? And again, you might have boundary routers between backbone and local area network. Lastly, what we have is the interconnected ASs. And, and again, it's really like the intra-AS is all about performance. Can you get information from here to there? Like for instance, whenever I do backups of like my laptop and stuff, where do I back up from? From home? And I have to go through Charter, and then Charter goes through here, there, there. Oh, now I made it to WPI's network, and then I back up onto the server here. Oh, do I do it here? I do it here. Why? There's latency performance. There's bandwidth performance. I win if I do it in the AS as opposed to multiple uh, mul going routing through an inter-AS process. On the other hand, the inter-AS process doesn't really care as much about performance as much as policy, right? And controlling, like, you know, people administering their own individual networks and then at the inter-AS level, it's really how all those guys play with each other. All right, so with that, so what did we learn today? So first of all, we obviously learned about flooding, but really the key thing is, and that's again through trace route. So if we run trace route, okay, so I'm curious. Let's see if I can run it from this computer. So we run trace route, this, this will provide a little bit of insight what you're seeing. Trace route, and let's try it again, www.mac. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, of course, if I have a typo and it's tarsfrit, it doesn't trace root. Yeah. There we go. So what this tells us is that this gives us a little bit of understanding about, like, you know, the process of getting information from point A to point B. In this case, from this computer, um, whatever it's called, RTR, PHS, R1, blah, 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 F, R, hit all the way, in this case, to Uganda, right? And so what ends up happening is, we, we like, each one of these hops, there's, there's, some, there's some sort of, like, um, uh, reason behind the madness of what's going on here. Like, you know, well, right over there, unknown.uni.net.za, boom, we just reached South Africa at that point. And then you can actually look up what these individual IP addresses, where do they belong to? Like, for instance, 130. 130 corresponds to all WPI IP addresses, unless, unless I'm wrong, right? And so what you will see is that in this case with trace route, what you're finding is, okay, how's my information being routed from point A to point B, right? And then request times out and we'll let that run for a little bit. So what we've seen in today's lecture, whoop, I'm just gonna kill it there. So what we've seen in today's lecture is this idea that although flat, route, uh, flat architectures are nice, we have to go with something more tiered in order for efficiency, um, for administrative purposes, and supporting uh, performance, okay? So with that, that concludes lecture 22. All right. So please don't forget that, um, that uh, 